first of all, I am so excited to be here. Uh, we just did, we just finished our annual mapping project in Papago Park in Phoenix with the Phoenix Geo Meetup Group. And just as I was working to finish um, finalizing, checking all the data before shipping it to the city of Phoenix, um, I got this invite from Jess. So this could not be better timing. Thank you so much, Jess, for your invite. Uh, so yeah, I'm here tonight to talk about the mapping project that we do every year in Papago Park. So I'll just, I can't read my whole slide because I actually have this funny Zoom thing in the way. There we go, it's minimized now. Now I can see what I'm looking at. So my role in Phoenix Geo Meetup Group is I'm one of the event organizers. Another one of our organizers is Scott and he organizes the OSM events. And then we have a main organizer for Phoenix Geo uh, named James um, as well. So if you ever come to one of our meetups, we do many diverse types of geography related meetups. Um, and I have to say, I think I recognized the other David on this call, perhaps from a meetup in the past. Um, I, anyway, I recognized your face. So it's good to see you again from Scottsdale. Okay, yeah, so, you, uh, yeah, <laughs> okay, cool. Okay, so first I wanted to say that I first uh, heard about OpenStreetMap when I was um, working for uh, the Botanical Garden in Phoenix way back when, and that was my previous, that was in a previous life. And um, actually, uh, I'm really excited to say, I don't know, Erin, can I say anything? Or should sure. I know? Yeah, no, okay. go ahead. I'm gonna say something is that Aaron Musgrave, who is on this call tonight, is now the GIS manager for Desert Botanical Garden. So congratulations to Aaron Musgrave. I'm I'm very excited um, that you got the job. And uh, and I'm almost a little bit embarrassed to be talking about Desert Botanical Garden because now it is I'm passing the torch to you. So uh, so with your permission, I'll mention a few words about the garden. Okay. <laughs> All right. So yeah, way back, uh, you know, a few years ago, we had issues where drivers were trying to get to Hole in the Rock, and they were driving down these lovely brick paths at Desert Botanical Garden to try to get to Hole in the Rock because the in-car navigation systems were all routing them through Desert Botanical Garden. There is no way through that garden. So just so you know, if you're ever trying to get to Hole in the Rock in the middle of Phoenix, go through the zoo to get there. But in an effort to try to stop people from driving over our plants, I got on OpenStreetMap and I updated the map on OpenStreetMap to try to change the map settings. And I was hoping that would percolate up to Bing Maps and maybe eventually to Google Maps. So I'm not sure if it did. And in fact, I still see that there is a dashed line going down from the back parking lot that looks like it is heading towards Hole in the Rock. So I suspect that's part of the problem. But Aaron, that's your problem now. So, <laughs> all right. Okay, moving on. Saguaro National. Okay, so the Saguaro, I should say the Saguaro survey that we do in Phoenix Geo uh, is inspired by two previous Saguaro surveys that I got to participate in over the years. The first one was at Desert Botanical Garden, the annual Saguaro inventory. The second one was at Saguaro National Park down by Tucson, and that was the Centennial Saguaro survey, which was conducted, I think, in 2015 and 2016. And we had hundreds of volunteers that I drove down there and joined a group of volunteers one day to inventory a segment, a small segment of, you know, probably a hundred acres or something of um, the Saguaro National Park, which is absolutely huge and amazing. It's a stupendous Saguaro landscape. These two inventories taught me a lot about um, why we inventory plants. So we, after I left the garden, um, two, this was two years ago, I hopped across the street to Papago Park um, and started thinking about 
I, I checked out the saguaros on that side of the of McDowell Parkway and started thinking about the fact that that population had been pretty much decimated in the history of Phoenix before saguaros were protected by all the laws that protect them now. People could just go into these places and collect saguaros to plant in their own backyard. So there are a lot of saguaros and other cacti that were removed from Papago Park um, in the decades before laws were passed to protect them. But an interesting thing I noticed walking through Papago Park down one of these trails is that there were a lot of saguaros that were about maybe six or seven feet tall that weren't quite visible above the creosote, but, uh, but there are a lot of them. So I became curious whether the saguaro population of Papago Park is actually making a comeback and we're about to see them because they're actually getting into their um, fastest growing years right now when they're about our height. So I'm curious if we're about to start seeing a lot of changes in the saguaro landscape of Papago Park. So that got me excited. So then I went to my meetup group and recruited them to come out and do an organized activity to map the entire park from trail side, carefully from trail side, I should say. We didn't just go traipsing, you know, off path or anything. So a little sidebar into the saguaro. The um, technical um, scientific name is Carnegie Gigantia because um, Andrew Carnegie gave a lot of money to the study of the saguaro. And I hear that he was embarrassed by the fact that they named it after him. But anyway, um, it is a pretty incredible plant. It grows up to, I think the tallest one recorded was 78 feet tall, like the size of an office building up in C Cave Creek. And that one fell down um, in like 1986 or something. Um, they, so they, they grow very tall. Uh, most of them around here, the tallest ones you're going to see are 30 feet tall. So a 78 foot saguaro is, I mean, that's huge. Uh, they also live uh, usually between 150 and 200 years. So that's another mind boggling thing about these plants is when you think about the history that's happened over the course of this plant's lifetime just like trees, you know, same thing. We, we get these ancient trees. Um, and then last, I just want to say that the saguaro is so important to Arizona's culture and the saguaro flower itself, which is these uh, kind of waxy white blooms that are about to come out. Actually, they're starting to come out right now on the saguaros around Phoenix are the state flower of Arizona. So this plant, um, is actually uh, hugely important to the culture of the Southwest and one of the best known plants in the world. So, um, and then I just wanna, I, I showed this odd picture of, a, of what's heading towards a saguaro skeleton on the right hand side. And that is simply to say that, yeah, these plants are so important to our culture that even when they look like this, we think they're cool. And we will collect this skeleton if, it, if it's not in a park like this it would sell for a lot of money for someone's, you know, for display somewhere. So these, these saguaros are hugely important to us. Okay, now we're gonna head to Versailles, France. Okay, why am I showing this completely different landscape? So one of the things I've run into over the years is that, well, and I'm assuming there might even be some of you on this uh, meeting tonight who are asking yourselves, why map plants? Why do we map plants? You know, it's a very curious thing to map. Trees maybe, but all the other plants, you know, isn't that kind of funny? That would be like mapping the grass, right? So I just wanted to um, say a few words about why we map plants, because it's not that intuitive actually. First of all, looking at this photo, this didn't come here by accident. Versailles gardens were planned, they were mapped. All the gardens and parks that you're mapping right now were built after they were planned in a landscape architecture document, essentially mapped. After we map and build these parks and gardens, the plants need to get taken care of. They don't trim themselves, they don't water themselves. 
they don't deal with their own pest problems. All that is handled by maintenance workers. And in order to do their work, it's really helpful to have uh, maps to show you where everything is. Um, another reason we map plants is the same reason we map anything, which is to go back and find it again. So for example, I know that Desert Botanical Garden has a collection of scientific plants. So each specimen out there has a unique ID, was collected somewhere, perhaps overseas, in the wild, at great expense, has extremely useful genetic scientific information stored in the plant itself. So getting back to that same exact plant is essential. So, uh, so I hope I've convinced you. I, I had some notes, but I, I can't read them right now. But I hope that's enough to convince you that uh, it's actually extremely helpful to map plants. OK. All right, so moving now back to our survey uh, that we conducted this year. Uh, I know that you guys are into, or one of the things um, just told me you might be curious about is how to do mobile mapping so that you can go out, map on your phone, and then, so most of OSM mapping I know is done from your computer on an aerial photo, but some things you can't see, especially in parks, you can't see under the trees. You might miss a bench, you might miss the details of the pathway. So you have to go out there in person to do some mapping. So what we, so I wanted to present to you some of the mapping technologies that we've used for the last three years for our meetup group. So in 2020, we used Esri's ArcGIS online web map. And we also at the same time entered the data into iNaturalist. Uh, in 2021, last year, we used Google My Maps. In 2022, this year, we used QField. And uh, it's still up in the air what we're going to use next year. So let me dive into uh, 20, uh, 2020. So um, the Esri web maps, uh, that was pretty good. Uh, we Unfortunately, the aerial photo that Esri provides is a little bit low res. So we ran into some limitations where we had to flip back and forth on our phones between Google Maps, which has a high res image that you can look at, and the Esri aerial photo or, or satellite imagery, which isn't that, is not detailed enough to see the saguaros. So that was a limitation. Um, it was nice. I already had a $100 home use account. And so I called Esri and I said, or I emailed them, and I said, is it okay if I use that? you know, and let all the volunteers use that as well. And they said, yes. Uh, but what we couldn't afford was Esri's really fancy collector app, which is now their field maps app. So, cause you need an individual license, paid license for that. We couldn't afford that. So we had to use these app, web app, web maps that are made for really for your computer screen. And so um, we couldn't see all the buttons on our phone. So it was kind of a bummer. Uh, so yeah, moving on to last year, um, we decided to go with Google My Maps because Google has fantastic imagery just built in. You don't have to, you know, prepare it. You don't have to upload it to your map or anything. It just is in Google Maps. So we used a functionality called Google My Maps, uh, which if you haven't used it before, it's free. You get to author your own map. Um, on your phone, it'll show you the GPS where you are, and you can add point locations on top of a very high res image, you know, aerial photo. So that was really good, except for the fact that Google has not come out with a mobile version of this yet. Um, I think they're working on one for Android, but they definitely don't have one for iOS yet. So again, we were looking at uh, an application that was designed for our desktop computers and not seeing all the buttons on our phone. So it was a little bit difficult sometimes. So then this year, uh, we heard that QGIS was coming out with a new product. Well, they'd recently come out with QField, which is QGIS for your phone for mobile data collection. And that is in, that's out for Android and it's in beta for iOS. 
So yeah, we had people downloading the real thing and we had people downloading the beta thing, but it worked okay. Um, but in addition to that, they came out with something even cooler this year, which is a QField cloud website where you can host your project in the cloud. And the, import, the, the reason why that is important is because if you just use QField, you can only have one person editing that one map. Whereas if you upload the map to QField Cloud, you can have all of your users simultaneously editing the map, which is what was required for our project so that we didn't step on each other's toes and map the same saguaros. So we still did that anyway, I'll explain that later. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, QField Cloud theoretically um, would have let us map simultaneously. Um, so, yeah, so that was pretty good. And then moving on to next year. Uh, okay, well, I should say, actually going back to this year again, one of the limitations with this is that all of this is still in beta. So some of us had the app crash repeatedly. We lost work. Um, I had it so that it just kept crashing and I'd have to uninstall the whole app and reinstall it in order to get it to stop crashing. Um, and in fact, that's what happened to me last weekend and why I have 20 Saguaros left is because my phone, I, I would have needed to uninstall and reinstall the whole thing. Um, I'm trying to think if there are any other, other than that, it was pretty user-friendly. Um, the only other drawback would be, I was not familiar with QGIS. I actually had to learn enough of QGIS to create my map. And then I had to use the, Q field plugin to package the map for mobile work. There's a plugin tool that does that. And then I had to use the Q field cloud plugin tool to upload it. Once it was packaged, then I could upload it to Q field cloud. So the instructions for doing that were not terribly straightforward because all this is brand new and in beta and stuff. But I was able to reach out on their forum on. Um, on GitHub and just ask for help. And they were extraordinarily helpful and very excited that people are using their, um, their product even while it's in beta. So that was kind of fun. Okay, so I'm kind of curious. I, I've been hearing about this new Esri um, product called Experience Builder, which is the, if, you're, if you've ever used the Esri software, it would be replacing eventually um, web app builder. And it looks like your the things you design in here are designed for mobile from the get go, like you can design a mobile version. So that would solve that problem. <clears throat> and then I guess we would just need to figure out how to get the high res imagery in there to solve our other problem. So, um, so that might be a possibility for next year. And then just want to show you, so that's it for the methodologies, but we can talk more about that later. Um, so for the results, I just wanted to show you some of the things we discovered in our project. So this is a photo of the whole park and you're seeing in front of you a series, there's actually a series of ponds. Um, uh, you can see one of them. Uh, there's the zoo to the left. Uh, Desert Botanical Garden is actually the hill on the far right side as part of their property. Hole in the Rock is just next to that. If you're familiar with um, Phoenix, you can see Camelback right in the middle in the distance. So this Papago Park, uh, it's, it's a very unique park landscape. It's, it could not be more different than Versailles Gardens, for example. It's very wild. It's, um, it's a desert landscape. And yet it has this interesting juxtaposition of palm trees and fish ponds in the middle of it. So it's a super interesting park. And um, here's a, a map of it actually. Uh, so this shows that over the last three years, we've actually mapped, we've systematically checked about a thousand acres of the Papago Park. That's not including Desert Botanical Garden. So apart from Desert Botanical Garden, we've mapped an additional thousand acres. 
And in those thousand acres, and you can see also there are some green areas left to map, including the Phoenix Zoo. We're going to try to get permission from the zoo maybe next year to map there. And then another interesting area is the Papago Park Military Reservation. We're going to try not to get accidentally shot at or anything, I guess, as we map either nearby that or even get permission to map on it. We'll see. So. And then moving into the saguaros um, of the area that we have scoured very carefully, and again on trail, we don't go off trail for this um, work, is we've found about 500 saguaros, and they vary in height from some of them are less than six inches tall to we found one the other day that was 35 feet tall at the um, at the Phoenix Zoo, which is actually really tall for Phoenix because rarely you rarely see saguaros above 30 feet in Phoenix. So that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, about 500 of those. Another interesting thing is that down to the south, um, there are not a lot of saguaros in the Tempe Preserve. There's an area of the park called the Tempe uh, Papago Park Preserve down on the south end near the 202. And there just aren't a lot of saguaros in that area. That's the area we mapped last year. Okay, moving on to some, okay, so now that we've collected this data, why are we collecting it? Again, back to that question, why are we mapping plants? So here are some of the applications. So the City of Phoenix Natural Resources Division is the group that we're assisting or we're giving th this data to that's in the Phoenix section of the park. And they actually contacted me the other day to say, hey, you know, is the data ready yet? Because they need the data. So I thought that was really interesting. I thought we were just, you know, volunteering and hopefully someone someday would use our data, but actually they are, they're waiting to receive our data. Um, City of Tempe Tree Survey have incorporated the data we collected last year. We mapped the juvenile saguaros in the Papago, the Tempe Papago Preserve last year. They've incorporated that into their tree survey data, and they include saguaros as trees. So that's interesting. Um, we are always looking for researchers to use this map. For example, I was contacted by someone at one of the remote sensing instructors at ASU last year who had gotten an NSF grant with two, two other researchers from across the country to try to come up with remote sensing classification algorithm that can detect saguaros and map with more accuracy than we have currently done can map the extent of the saguaro population across the Southwest and in Mexico. So that would be an extremely groundbreaking achievement if they're able to do that. And they contacted us because they needed data sets to ground truth their algorithm on. So that was pretty cool. I am not sure if they ended up actually receiving those data sets. I put them in contact with the city of Phoenix and um, also actually with Desert Botanical Garden. And then I didn't really follow up after that. So not quite sure if they ended up receiving those, but it should be interesting to see if they succeed. Um, oh, I did, speaking of Desert Botanical Garden, I did hear that they are also leading up a Phoenix wide, some kind of, a, Saguaro mapping uh, community involvement project this year for the Saguaros of Phoenix. So um, I look forward to collaborating with them potentially on that work. Um, and then just in general, the Saguaros of Papago Park are the canary in the coal mine. So our temperature is rising. Papago Park is in the middle of the heat island. Whatever happens to the saguaros in Papago Park is going to happen likely before it starts happening to all the saguaros in the rest of the neighborhoods of Phoenix. So yeah, that's interesting. Um, off to the right is a topo map that a friend of uh, mine sent from the um, Greater Phoenix Orienteering Club. 
where he actually plans to, he, in the past, he's tried mapping the saguaros as landmarks on the orienteering courses, and he would like to incorporate our saguaros into the, um, into the topo map for uh, Papago Park. And then last, let's see. Yes, I'll just switch now to the next slide. It's the same text though, different picture. Um, the last question is, should we upload this data to OSM? I haven't, I think we could. I think all we would have to do is ask um, the data owners, that would be city of Tempe and city of uh, Phoenix for permission to do so and make the case to them. I, I'm not quite sure what, if they would have any concerns or um, what the procedure would be for keeping that data updated in the future. Um, but perhaps we could discuss that um, after the presentation. And one of the things I wanted to mention, if we do that, one of the limitations is that we can't actually upload data for the saguaros that are under about two feet tall. Um, because one of the, or at least that would be my, I don't know if city of Phoenix and Tempe would have that limitation, but that would be my strong encouragement because one of the reasons we're doing this mapping project is because of the Papago Park's history of, of people um, collecting saguaros, as I mentioned, um, for their own backyards. So uh, it would not be a good idea for us to post the locations of the best saguaros, you know, like this one under uh, blooming Palo Verde here. This might be a little bit tempting. So, um, so that kind of thing. Okay, and then last, I just wanted to show you guys some of the resources that I thought of that you might find interesting. So we have a meetup group for geography in the Phoenix Valley. It's called Phoenix Geo, and you can join our meetup group, um, especially come out and help us map saguaros probably next January. There's also a meetup group called Plant Map, and they specialize in mapping technologies for mapping plants, whether that be in a park or a public garden or a zoo or you know, plants in the wild, all those things. They especially uh, focus on botanical gardens. So that's a really great meetup group to join. Um, beyond that, there's uh, the American Public Gardens Association, which if you are, if you're a member, uh, I believe you have access to a discount. You might wanna follow this website and check it out, but I believe there's some kind of a discount for members with the Esri software. Um, and then heading up to Alliance for Public Gardens GIS, they actually specialize in, uh, in plant map, GIS for plant mapping. And then I mentioned earlier, the Greater Phoenix Orienteering Club. Um, that's a great group. Um, and they use, they incorporate plant maps into their topo or plants on their topo maps as landmarks. And then I just, I don't, I don't know if there's anyone in here who would like to map their, their, you know, vegetable garden or their back garden, but this website actually had a pretty clever way for creating a, um, a simple map of your back garden. And then last, I wanted to point out, this is sort of obligatory for you all to check out go and listen to this um, YouTube recording of, uh, it's pronounced Segu Saguaro or Saguero or something by the Austin Lounge Lizards. So that's, uh, that's recommended listening for everyone for later. It's a good song. Okay, and then last, I just wanna thank the volunteers. We had a lot of great volunteers turn out this year. And here they are. and then open it up for questions.